All right, thank you all for being here this evening and another opportunity to uh, stand before you all. Thank you, Pastor Shelley, again for allowing me to, um, to fill the pulpit this evening as well. And thank you all for your hospitality this uh, afternoon, men. Uh, had a great chance to meet some great people and out soul winning and out eating as well. Uh, Brother Samson is a pho expert, as I realized. You know, that's my first time eating pho, but he knows everything you need to know about it. So I definitely enjoyed that. And um, uh, so I won't be long before you all this evening, but there in Revelation chapter 2, the Bible says in verse 2, uh, actually, let's pick up verse 1. The Bible says, Unto the angel of the church of Ephesus write, These things saith he that holdeth the seven stars in his right hand, who walketh in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks. I know thy works and thy labor and thy patience, and how thou canst not bear them which are evil, and thou hast tried them which say they are apostles and are not, and hast found them liars. And if you look at verse 2, this is where the title of my message comes from. The Lord Jesus Christ is writing his letter to the church of Ephesus, and he says, I know thy works and thy labor and thy patience, and how thou canst not bear them which are evil. This evening's message, the title of the message is Bearing with Evil Doors. Bearing with Evil Doors. The Lord Jesus Christ, uh, as we, if you're familiar with the book of Revelation, he starts out writing these, uh, these, uh, the letter to the churches, and he's addressing each and every church uh, of the seven churches of, of Asia here. And what happens is, is every church has something. There are some churches that have, uh, you know, where Jesus Christ the Lord is commending them. And there is others where he's commending them and pretty much reprimanding them. They have issues going on in their church. And here in Ephesus is one of those church where they have some good things going on, and, and yet they have some things that they have gotten away from. But the Lord, I'm going to zone in on this message, not so much as far as what they got away from, the first works and everything, but I'm going to look on the, the fact that he was applauding them. He was commending them on certain things. One of them that he says that how thou canst not bear them which are evil, right? So the title of my message is Bearing with Evil Doors. This church at Ephesus, I like to consider this church, these are my own words that I consider about this church, but I like to call them the zero tolerance church, the no tolerance church, right? Because the Lord Jesus Christ said that thou canst not bear them which are evil, which means that there is some things, as generous as this church might have been, as much compassion as they have been and love, there's just certain things that they're not going to put up with. There's a line where this church is going to draw a line and say, no, no, no. And the Lord Jesus Christ even says, thou canst not bear them which are evil. He's commending them and telling them and applauding them for the fact that, listen, there is some evil that tries to creep into your church and you don't allow it. So first of all, let's look at this word to bear. Look, uh, turn over, hold your finger here in Revelation and turn with me to Colossians chapter 3. Because we get uh, this word bear, we really don't use it as much. You hear the word forbearance, and it's normally used in a uh, term where you're speaking out possibly about a loan or something that may be in forbearance or so. We rarely use the word, but we can get a, a biblical definition of uh, what it means to, to forbear or to bear with something. If you look at verse 12 in, in Colossians chapter 3, verse 12, the Bible says, Put on, therefore, as the elect of God, holy and beloved, bowels of mercies, kindness, humbleness of mind, meekness, long suffering, forbearing one another, and forgiving one another. If any man have a quarrel against any, even as Christ forgave you, so also do ye. So you see where these words start to become interchanged. He says, humbleness of mind, meekness, but then he says, long suffering, and it's followed by the word forbearing one another and forgiving one another and that's what bearing with someone is that's what forbearance is it's a time where you are long suffering with someone it's when you're enduring with something it's when you're putting up with something right and sometimes when you're putting up with things you also get to a point where you just have to sometime overlook some things right 
That's what it is to forbear. It's sometimes where someone can be in the wrong and you just say, I know they're wrong. I'm not going to say anything. I'm just going to have to overlook some things. And that's what it is to long suffer. That's what it is to endure with somebody or forbear with someone. So going back to, with that in mind, going back to Revelation chapter 2, the Lord Jesus Christ is commending this church that they are not bearing with evildoers. He's commending them that they are not long-suffering with evildoers. They are not enduring with evildoers. They are not putting up with, they are not overlooking evil that is creeping in into their church. Now, wouldn't it be good if this could be said about every church, right? That'd be good if the church if people will say about the church that, listen, the church is the place where, yes, it is the, the, uh, the place of the living God is the house of the living God. It is the pillar and grounds of the truth. Yes, it is a place where you can find love and you can find compassion. It's a place where they will have mercy upon you. But it also is a place that, listen, they're not going to bear with evildoers. It would be good if that could be said about the churches of today. But the truth is, or the question is, is that really the case? It would be good, as I mentioned, if we could be known to be a church that does not bear with evildoers. And you would think that where well, every church that has the name church on it would just, everybody should just know that, hey, you know, that is one place where you don't go do that at, right? No, that's, that's not the case. And you know what? Even in the Bible, we're going to look at a couple churches that even this was the case in their church where, you know what? They put up with evildoers. They allowed evil doctrine and just bad doctrine to creep in and bad people to creep in into the churches. And they bared with these evildoers. Turn with me to uh, the book of Galatians. Galatians chapter one. We was here this morning. Galatians chapter 1, Galatians chapter 1, look at verse 6. The Bible says, I marvel that ye are so soon removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ unto another gospel, which is not another, but there be some that trouble you and would pervert the gospel of Christ. So notice what Paul here is addressing. He starts out addressing his letter to the church and pretty much this is the theme of the book of Galatians that there are bad people who are just crept into this church into the churches of Galatia and they're just turning it upside down with just bad doctrine so that's the theme of this of this book but he says our marvel that ye are so soon removed from him that called you into Christ that excuse me that called you into the grace of Christ unto another gospel but then he says, which is not another, but there be some that trouble you. Right. There are two things to consider about the church of Galatia or the churches of Galatia. Number one, when he says some troubling them, there are some in verse seven, but there be some that trouble you, which means when you when he says that you have to understand that these people are among them. These people are in their church because he said there be some that trouble you. So how can they trouble them from afar? They're not troubling them via Internet during these days. The Internet is not around. So how can they possibly be affecting this church? Well, maybe the fact that they have infiltrated this church here. So he's saying there be some that trouble you. So this is the first thing we need to consider that this church has been infiltrated. With this in mind, stay in Galatians. Uh, actually, we'll come back to this, but Galatians chapter 5 just about two pages over. And we're talking about the fact that this church has been infiltrated with bad people. Galatians chapter five, verse seven, the Bible says, ye did run well. Who did hinder you that ye should not obey the truth? This persuasion cometh not of him that calleth you. Paul said, ye did run well. Hey, well, how did, how did they run well? Well, they believed on the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ was the laid foundation for this church. They believed on him. They were good to go, but then bad people crept into the church. And he says, ye did run well. He asked the question, who did hinder you that ye should not obey the truth? This persuasion cometh not of him that called you. What is he saying? This is not of God. What you are believing, this did not come from the Holy Spirit. This is not of God. This persuasion cometh not of him that calleth you. A little leaven leaveneth the whole lump. 
I have confidence in you through the Lord that ye will be none otherwise minded, but he that troubleth you shall bear his judgment. Well, what are we talking about? The fact that someone has infiltrated the church. These evildoers are in the church. He that troubleth you shall bear his judgment, whosoever he be. He says, and I, brethren, if I yet preach circumcision, why do I yet suffer persecution? Then is the offense of the cross seized. I would they were even cut off, which trouble you. So this term here, I wish that they were cut off. Paul understands that there are some people who has just crept in. They're preaching another gospel. They're preaching circumcision in order to get uh, saved. They're preaching another gospel that is not faith alone on the Lord Jesus Christ. And then because it's damnable heresy, he actually uses a, a Old Testament term in verse 12 that says, I would they were even cut off, which trouble you. Now, what does he mean? I wish that they were cut off. I heard many explanations about this where people will say, well, he just mean that these people were just cut off from being part of the body of Christ. They were just cast out of the church. No, that's not it. If you go to an NIV, I remember this from years ago. Uh, this same verse says, uh, I wish that they would emasculate themselves or some, some craziness like that. You know, but no, that, that's not it either. What is Paul talking about? Well, you go back to the Old Testament. We're not going to do this. But constantly you see the Lord interchanging the word cut off with death. He's saying a person should be cut off or then he would interchange it with a person is to be put to death. So what Paul is saying here is that whoever this is that is troubling the church in verse 12, he said, I would they were even cut off, which trouble you. He's practically saying, I wish they would die. I wish they would be killed. Why? Because they're preaching damnable heresy. So number one to consider is that. When he say there are some that are troubling you, we have to consider that these people have infiltrated the church. But number two, we have to understand that when this church has been infiltrated by just bad people, we have to take this in consideration that this church is actually bearing with them. They're actually putting up with the doctrine. How do we know that? Well, go back to chapter one, just two pages back, chapter one, and notice what Paul says in verse six. I marvel that ye are so soon removed. So what does that mean? Well, that they're bearing with these people. They're putting up with them. They're giving them a platform to get up and preach their heresy. He's saying, I marvel that ye are so soon removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ unto another gospel. So the second thing to consider is that they are actually putting up with the evildoers. They are having long suffering with the evildoers. They are bearing with them. And this is just basically showing that they're giving these people the time of day. When they're getting up preaching circumcision for salvation, they're saying, hey, well, let's see what this guy has to say. They're not throwing anybody out of the church. They're being so soon removed from the grace of Christ. In Galatians chapter 2, just one chapter over, Paul speaks about to the church here how he ran into a similar situation when he went back to Jerusalem some years earlier. And in Galatians chapter 2, he starts to speak about how when he got to Jerusalem, there were some false brethren that had crept in, and they basically wanted to try to get Titus circumcised. And they wanted to preach circumcision for salvation. And Paul, he basically lets this church of, of Galatia know how he dealt with these men. Notice what he says in chapter 2, verse, um, verse 3, actually. He says, but neither Titus, who was with me, being a Greek, was compelled to be circumcised. And that because of false brethren unawares brought in, who came in privily to spy out our liberty, which we have in Christ Jesus, that they might bring us into bondage. To whom we gave place by subjection, no, not for an hour, but that the truth of the gospel might continue with you. So notice what he said. When these guys tried to come in, and notice what he said. He says, false brethren unawares. So were these guys saved? No. They were pretending to be saved. They had all the right, you know, things to say, all the church jargon, I'm pretty sure. But they were false. And they want to get Titus circumcised. And notice how he dealt with these people who just were just evildoers that came with bad doctrine. 
It said, to whom we gave place by subjection, no, not for an hour. What is he saying? We're not putting up with it. We're not bearing with it. We're not going to have any long suffering. We're not going to say, well, he may be on to something. It's kind of different, but let's see what he has to say. No, he said, not for an hour, not the time of day. Sorry, buddy. It's not working over here. So basically, he's telling the church of Galatia, this is how I handled a situation where there was just evildoers who was creeping into the church here. Let's turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 11. 2 Corinthians chapter 11, probably about three pages back. We have here where the church of Corinth is, is a church that a church that has a lot of division going on, right? I have Cephas, I have Paul, I have Apollos, I have Christ. They're, they're, they have a lot of divisions in there. Also, it's a lot of just wickedness going on in this church, right? The man who has his father's wife, he's committing fornication with his father's wife, right? But then also the fact that Paul is challenged by this church on the validity of his apostleship. They don't even think he's a, a legit apostle. So they have a lot going on. And on top of that, Paul just gets to a point where he just thinks that this church is just gullible. He just thinks that, that they're credulous. Well, what does he mean? Well, pretty much that they can easily be enticed. They can easily be swayed away. They can easily just believe any and every type of doctrine. They have so much division among them. He's pretty much saying like this, you guys, I really believe are gullible. Notice what he says in, um, in verse 1. He says, would to God ye could bear with me a little in my folly, and indeed bear with me. For I am jealous over you with godly jealousy. For I have espoused you to one husband, that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. But I fear lest by any means, as the serpent beguiled Eve through his subtlety, so your mind should be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. For if he cometh preaching to another Jesus, whom we have not preached, or if ye receive another spirit, which ye have not received, or another gospel, which ye have not accepted. Notice these words, ye might well bear with him. <laughs> he's at a point where he's like, I really don't trust your judgment. I, I think you can be swayed just as Eve was, was uh, deceived by the, by the serpent. He's saying the same way, I believe if someone comes with another gospel, with another, uh, with another Jesus, with another spirit that you have not received, he says, ye might well bear with him. Well, what is he saying? You're going to have some long suffering with that, with that guy. And, you know, it ought not to be said about us. Turn back to Revelation chapter 2, that we just endure such things as the church. The church, as I mentioned, should be the pillar and grounds of the truth. And wouldn't it be great if, if every church would be, you know, notarized as a church that say, hey, you know, don't go over there with that. They, they're going to throw you out. They're going to pick you up by your neck and cast you out of there. <laughs> but Revelation chapter 2 we're going to look at the church of Ephesus as an example because the church of Ephesus actually, you don't have to turn there, but in Acts chapter 20, they received a warning from Paul. As Paul was departing from Ephesus, they received a warning from him and he tells them in Acts chapter 20, verse 28, he says, take heed there, uh, therefore unto yourselves and to all the flock over the which the Holy Ghost hath made you overseers to feed the church of God, which he hath purchased with his own blood. Notice this. Now, when you go back in context, he's talking to the church of Ephesus in this chapter. He says, for I know this, that after my departing shall grievous wolves enter in among you, not sparing the flock. Also of your own selves shall men arise, speaking perverse things to draw away disciples after them. Therefore, watch. And remember that by the space of three years, I cease not to warn every one night and day with tears. So when we hear in, in uh, Revelation chapter 2, we're going to see here and we can learn from Revelation chapter 2 here, this church of Ephesus, that they took heed to the warnings. That yet yeah, grievous men, wicked men did creep up in their church just as Paul told them it would happen. So verse, uh, let's look at verse 2. In Revelation chapter 2, 
the first thing that we can learn from this church when it comes to bearing with evildoers, the first thing we learn from them, we'll see for one, is just not bearing with wicked men. Not bearing with wicked men. Verse 2 says, I know thy works and thy labor and thy patience and how thou canst not bear them which are evil. Now, what does he mean when he say them that are evil? Well, them is not really specific, right? That's just a broad stroke. So that's not really specific. So, you know, you have to say, well, what is he talking about? What he's talking about here, bearing with evil doors uh, or how thou canst not bear them uh, which are evil. This is not talking about just a now all of sin is sin. But then there are some grievous sins, right? There are some horrible sins that ought not to be done. There are just some malicious, just just evil that should not be allowed in the church. So the thing is, yes, you will. Everybody has some sort of sin in, in their life. OK, if we say we have not have not sinned, you know, we just deceive ourselves, as the scriptures say. We all have a sin, but then everybody does not have grievous sins. That those type of sins that make you just want to vomit and say, oh, what disgust, get away from me. Everybody doesn't have those type of sins. So this church here, it's not like you have to, in order to attend the church of Ephesus, you have to be sinless perfection. Because if that was the case, nobody could, right? Nobody could come to church if you just had to be sinless. But the fact that Jesus is saying, how thou canst not bear them which are evil, this is talking about just grievous sins. You know, and it ought to be said about us, as I mentioned, any church. It ought to be said about Peer Words Baptist Church that that is a loving church. They go out when it's 110 degrees in the, in the summer. They going out knocking doors and they sweating. They love, they have compassion, but don't go there with the foolishness. Don't go there because you know what? They are not going to bear with the evildoers. And they ought to be said about every church. And, you know, you have people out there who say, well, the church is for everybody. That sounds cute, but it's not. The church is not for everybody. You know, and they saying, well, you know, the, 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 the homo guy that's, that's born that way, he needs to come in so he can get born again. Or the, the transgender guy, he's confused. Maybe he can come in. Or the pedophile, go ahead and let, these are just grievous. Or the adultery that's just want to get, you know, the, the woman that's in, in, the, uh, in the seats and want to talk to and try to commit adultery. You know, let him in. Let, no. Those are just grievous sins. The drunkard, these are just grievous sins that the Bible is calling out. And it ought not to be allowed inside the church. Everybody's not a drunkard. Everybody's not an adulterer. Everybody is not some transge transgender freak, right? So these are just, just grievous sins that should not be allowed in a church. Sinful practices that should not be allowed in a church. What about just selling Starbucks and, and uh, bookstores and everything like that? Well, you know, there are some things that ought not to be brought in a church. Then not only that, but just dealing with evil doors that are saved, right? Hey, you can have saved people who are just caught up in bad sins. And you know what? As we learn from 1 Corinthians chapter 5, he didn't say, hey, bear with those guys. Hey, yeah, the drunkard, the adulterer, you know, the covetous, you know, the idolater, the railer. Go ahead and just let them hang around. No, he said, you know, to cast that person out. And so we see there where even the church of Corinth, Paul was writing and saying, listen, don't bear with that guy who is committing fornication with his father's wife. He said, turn, basically deliver such a one unto Satan for the destruction of the flesh. So we see from the church of Ephesus, the wicked men, just grievous sins. The Lord Jesus Christ was commending them for not bearing with evildoers, not bearing with just grievous sins. And we can learn the same thing. So that's number one. Number two, the false apostle. Notice what he says in, in uh, verse two again. He says, I know thy works and thy labor and thy patience and how thou canst not bear them which are evil. And thou hast tried them which say they are apostles and are not and has found them liars. Turn to Acts chapter one. 
he commends them also concerning the false apostle. The apostle who will come and say that I am an apostle. And notice what he says. And thou hast tried them. What does he mean thou hast tried them? Well, he's saying you tested them. You tested them to see if they were legitimate apostles. Well, you just asked the question, well, why do they need to be tested anyway? Well, they need to be tested because there are qualifications in order for a person to be considered an apostle. I'll just quote some verses. And here's the thing. You have many people who got saved during the time of the Lord Jesus Christ, during the time of the apostles and during the, the ministry of Paul and so on. You had many people that were saved, but not everybody was an apostle. I'll quote 1 Corinthians chapter 9, and we can just put together this, the pieces of the puzzle here, and we can kind of figure out what it was to be an apostle. What were some of those qualifications? For one, Paul says, am I not an apostle? Am I not free? Notice these words. Have I not seen Jesus Christ our Lord? Are not ye my work in the Lord? So notice what he affiliates with him being an apostle. Have I not seen the Lord Jesus Christ, our Lord? Yeah, you think about Paul on the Damascus road. Yeah, he had an encounter with the Lord Jesus Christ. Didn't he hear the Lord Jesus Christ's voice? Did not he know for a fact that Jesus Christ was resurrected? Yeah, he, he has seen the Lord Jesus Christ. But then 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 5 through 8, he says here, he says, and that he was seen of Cephas. This is speaking about the resurrection of Jesus Christ. He says, and that he was seen of Cephas, then of the twelve. After that, he was seen above 500 brethren at once, of whom the greater part remain unto this day. But some are falling asleep. After that, he was seen of James, then of all the apostles. And last of all, he was seen of me also as one born out of due time. So notice here in, in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, he's talking about the fact that all these people, and he, and he puts these people in the category of being an apostle. And one thing they all have in common is that they all seen the Lord Jesus Christ. He says he was seen above, he was seen of Cephas. He was seen above 500 brethren at once. Then he says he was seen of James, then of all the apostles. And then he said, last of all, he was seen of me. So Paul was saying, last of them all, the last person to see the Lord Jesus Christ, Paul said, was me. And he says, as one born out of due time, basically one that's just late. In other words, what he's saying, right? But then in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 12, he says, truly the signs of an apostle were wrought among you in all patience and signs and wonders and mighty deeds. So notice what else goes along with being an apostle. Not only have you seen the Lord Jesus Christ, but he told the church of Corinth that when he was among them, he said the signs of an apostle was wrought among you. Well, here, here were the signs. He said, in all patience and signs and wonders and mighty deeds. Well, what is he talking about? He's talking about miracles. Paul healed many. He, he healed many that were sick of diseases. He cast out evil spirits. Listen, your average saved person cannot do this, and they could not do this. So what we gather is that we have people that seen the Lord Jesus Christ, and then people who did signs and wonders in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, where they healed many. If you're there in Acts chapter 1, they're trying to figure out a replacement for Judas. And, and they want to make sure that the replacement for Judas meets some certain qualifications because this man will be considered an apostle. Notice what he says in verse 21. Wherefore, of these men which have company with us all the time that the Lord Jesus went in and out among us, beginning from the baptism of John until that same day that he was taken up from us, must one be ordained a witness with us of his resurrection. So notice what they said. This person had to be accompanied with the Lord Jesus Christ, as the Lord Jesus Christ went in and out during his ministry. So, and then not only that, it says, beginning from the baptism of John. So basically from the time that John the Baptist was around and from the time where Jesus was baptized by John, all the way through the Lord Jesus Christ's ministry, and then we just seen where brethren seen him resurrected. And then he says here, beginning from the baptism of John until the same day that he was taken up from us. 
So which means that this person was present to see the Lord Jesus Christ ascend into heaven at the same time. They were there. Must one be ordained to be witness of us, be witness, excuse me, be a witness with us of his resurrection. So notice all these qualifications that we see in order to be an apostle. You was there the whole time. That's three and a half years plus for Jesus Christ's ministry, right? That's you seeing Jesus in and out, preaching any, any and everywhere. You're there doing his ministry. You there to see his resurrection. You seeing him like everybody else. Then you witness him get ascended up into heaven on the cloud. Then verse 23, and they appointed two, Joseph called Barsabbas, whose surname Justice and Matthias. And they prayed and said, Thou, Lord, which knowest the hearts of all men, show whether of these two thou hast chosen, that he may take part of this ministry, notice this, and apostleship, from which Judas by transgression fell, that he might go to his own place. And they gave forth their lots, and the lot fell upon Matthias, and he was numbered with the eleven apostles. So notice those qualifications for an apostle, right? And then you just say, well, let's tie this back into the church of Ephesus. Because the Lord Jesus Christ said, you try those who say that they are apostles. So when someone would come to the church of Ephesus and they say, yeah, I'm Apostle Rick. Well, what are they going to do? They're going to start trying them according to these things. So for one, we see that you had to been there doing Jesus Christ's ministry, going in and out. So this is just my imagination here. But I can imagine, oh, you're an apostle? Yeah, I'm an apostle. Okay, uh, where did Jesus preach the mount of, you know, the, uh, excuse me, where was the Mount of Transfiguration at? Uh, uh, I think Mount, I, I don't know. Okay, well, you know, where was he baptized at? Uh, I, I don't know. Where they constantly trying them, and I can imagine they're probably like, this guy is not, okay, well, how did he ascend up to heaven? Uh, in the chariot of whirlwind? The whirlwind chariot? <laughs> Wrong. Elijah did that. So you, they probably, you know, this is my own imagination. They're probably trying these guys because this is a person who say, I seen the Lord Jesus Christ. I was there. And Jesus said, you tried them who say they are apostles and are not, but are liars. They're liars. Right. So you think about this today. You say, what's the best application? If you think of thinking the way I think. And reading this, you can only you can't help but to just call out the Pentecostal church, right? Right? Who who their women pastors and whoever pastors, they just say, Oh, my name is Apostle Such and Such. I'm Apostle Benny Hinn. You know, I'm Apostle this and that. You know, and the thing is, a lot of them, I believe that they ignorantly do this. They don't, I think they don't know what it means to be an apostle. So you just got to, you know, just kind of look at them like, I, I don't think you understand that or so. But, you know, but you just ask, where does that come from? Where does it come from that they want to be called an apostle, right? Well, they have what's called the fivefold ministry. I don't know if you all know this, but the fivefold ministry. And you say, where does that come from? You don't have to turn there, but Ephesians chapter 4. When the Lord Jesus Christ ascended, it speaks about the gifts that he gave among the church so the church can be edified. And they get from this scripture uh, the fivefold ministry, and they choose any of these and say, yeah, that's, that's me. And they call themselves apostle or evangelist whatsoever. Ephesians 4.10 says, he that descended is the same also that ascended up far above all heavens, that he might fill all things. And he gave some, notice this, apostles, and some, well, here's your fivefold ministry, excuse me, and he gave some apostles and some prophets, and some evangelists, and some pastors and teachers for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. So that's basically where they get where I'm an apostle from, because they're thinking about the, they call this the fivefold ministry, and they say these, uh, these ministries are still at work today. So for that cause, they will call themselves apostles such and such, not knowing that they don't know the qualifications of being an apostle. They never seen the Lord Jesus Christ. They were not there doing his ministry. So they don't know that. And you say, well, we don't really have people that come around here that say I'm an apostle. You know, so how can I apply this, you know, to my life? 
Well, I think the fact that the Lord Jesus Christ says, and thou hast tried them, you have tested them, which say they are apostles and are not and has found them liars. I think what we can learn from this and apply as a church is be careful about people who just say that they are right. People that just say that they are people who would just walk in the church and you just ask them, hey, you know, uh, let me ask you about salvation. Oh, I'm saved already. <laughs> uh, I'm saved. My my mom was a pastor. You know, my mom was a deacon. You know, I know I know already or even while you out just how soul went in. As soon as you come from the church. Oh, I know everything about the Bible where they will say that they're saved. They'll say that they've been born again. But what happens is you have to try them. You have to test them. And you know what? Sadly, they're found out to be liars. They found out that, no, you're really not saved. They're not saved. So we can learn that. Yeah. When people come in the church, it's good to try them. I'm sure many people have come in here and said that they were saved. If you all question them about salvation, I'm sure they say, oh, yeah, I'm saved. I've been saved since I was one. I'm sure they will say something like that, right? But then when you test them, when you try them, you see that they found out to be short. So that's a good application we can make. So deeds that evil deeds that this church of Ephesus was not bearing with. For one, wicked men. Number two, the false apostles. But then number three, this will be the last point here. The deeds of the Nicolaitans. The deeds of the Nicolaitans. Look at verse three. Jesus says, and has borne and has patience and for my name's sake has labored and has not fainted. And nevertheless, I have somewhat against thee because thou hast left thy first love. Remember, therefore, from whence thou art fallen and repent and do the first works or else I will come unto thee quickly and will remove thy candlestick out of his place, except thou repent. But this thou hast, that thou hatest the deeds of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. So we see here that the Lord Jesus Christ, the third thing that he commends them for is not only just not bearing with evil doers, just grievous sins, but not only just not enduring with or bearing with the, the false apostle, but then not bearing with the deeds of the Nicolaitans. And, you know, I, I really have a kick out of this doctrine here, the Nicolaitans, because if you like me, you have to read the Nicolaitans and just say, man, he, he doesn't say much about the Nicolaitans. And then I remember some years ago, I went on on the Internet and, you know, on the Internet, you can go down a rabbit trail. And I found some commentary years ago talking about the deeds of the Nicolaitans. And it's, it's funny because they come up with the deeds of the Nicolaitans. They say it's a cult that started by Nicholas. I don't know if you all heard this, but whatever. Uh, the, the guy Nicholas, the man Nicholas, if you all can recall in Acts chapter 6, where there is a, um, uh, the daily ministration between the Hebrew women and the, uh, the Greek women. The Greek women felt that they were not being serviced properly, or they were being shorthanded, right? So they said, look out among you seven men of an honest report, filled with the Holy Ghost, and we know who those seven men were. You know, two of them were really famous. Stephen was one, right? And the other was Philip, who later on known as Philip the Evangelist. But amongst those who were named was, was Nicholas, right? So what the Internet gathers is that just because his name is Nicholas, he fits the bill for being the Nicolaitans, the creator of the Nicolaitans. So what happens is they say that although he was chosen to be one of the seven, later on, although he was serving Christ, he basically became a rebel. And then he decided to stop following Christ and he started his own cult and he called it the Nicolaitans. You know, that would make a good Hollywood script, right? But the fact is, that's not in the Bible. That's why we have to get our doctrine from the Bible. This is what I say. How about we just go and look at what the Lord Jesus Christ said about the Nicolaitans and just leave it there. Notice what he said. But this thou hast, that thou hatest the deeds of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. This verse, and then in the same chapter, he says in verse 14, But I have a few things against thee, because thou hast there them that hold the doctrine of Balaam, who taught Balaam to cast a stumbling block before the children of Israel, to eat things sacrificed unto idols and to commit fornication. So this is one doctrine by itself, the doctrine of Balaam, right? But then there's a separate doctrine that this church of Pergamos is holding on to. It says, so has, verse 15, so has thou also them that hold the doctrine of the Nicolaitans, which thing I hate. 
Repent, or else I will come unto thee quickly and will fight against them with the sword of my mouth. Well, Jesus, the Lord Jesus doesn't go much into the deeds and the doctrine of the Nicolaitans. So how do you get this whole spinoff of a story of a guy named Nicholas who rebels against Christ and then starts his own, own cult? Well, it, he, the Bible doesn't say that. So what we get from here for one is that how about we just take the Bible at face value? How about we preach what's in the Bible? How about we take the Lord's word just as it is? We don't need to add anything to it. And me personally, my personal opinion, the fact that he didn't say much about it, maybe that says a lot. The fact that he said, I hate them, I hate their deeds, I hate their doctrine, maybe it was so bad and so blasphemous that he didn't feel the need to even dwell on it. And that's how I look at it. This is just my personal opinion. But verse 6, this thou hast that thou hatest the deeds of the Nicolaitans. And then we see in verse 15, the church of Pergamos, that thou also has them that hold the doctrine of the Nicolaitans. We have two separate churches here, two separate locations. And they, one is on the Lord's plan, the other is not. The church of Ephesus love what the Lord seems to love, and they hate what the Lord seems to hate. They hate the deeds of the Nicolaitans. Jesus said, which thing I also hate. But then the church of Pergamos, he says, so has thou also them that hold the doctrine of the Nicolaitans, which thing I hate. So you have a church who hold the things that Jesus Christ hates. But then you have a church who hate what the Lord Jesus Christ hates. We have two churches that are on separate plans. And what we gather can gather from this as a church is that we ought to love the things that, God's lo that God loves and we ought to hate the things that God hates. And, you know, you have people who say, well, you guys need to be more Christ-like. You need, you need to be more loving. You know, if Christ was around today, this is how he would be. <laughs> That's the one that really kills me. If Christ was around today, he would just be loving. He would love the LGB, whatever alphabet they're on now. He would love this community. He, he would be all for, you know, the adultery and, and for He would be just merciful. He would just overlook the adultery. No, how about you just read and get to know the God of the Bible? Because the God of the Bible is a God of love. He's a God of compassion. He's a God that is long-suffering, but he's a God of wrath as well. And he's a God that does hate. And we see that through the scripture. Jesus Christ said the deeds of the Nicolaitans, I hate. So we learn that, you know what? There is a time, as the Bible say, there's a time to love and a time to hate. You know who wrote that? Yeah, that was the God of the Bible. These six things doth the Lord hate, yea, seven are abomination, right? That is the God of the Bible. So there are some things that God hates. And as a church, we ought to love what God loves and we ought to hate what God hates. The church of Ephesus here is being commended by the Lord Jesus Christ because they hate the deeds of the Nicolaitans. And Jesus say, which thing I hate? I hate it too. And I commend you for hating it. <clears throat> he's commending the church for not bearing with the deeds of the Nicolaitans. But also, how about if you, you can put two and two together, this is just like, you know, the church of Galatia where you have to put two and two together where Paul says that there was some that was in the church that was infiltrating. Well, you have to say that the Nicolaitans were trying to infiltrate this church trying to infiltrate it with his deeds and with his doctrine, or else this verse would not make sense that the Lord Jesus Christ said to them about them hating the deeds of the Nicolaitans. It means that they were trying to get in there and turn the place upside down. So which means that they were not dealing with their doctrines. The Nicolaitans just didn't have a deed, but they had a doctrine. No, this is not commentary, but this is what the Bible says. Verse 15, so has thou also them that hold the doctrine of the Nicolaitans. So they had a teaching, which the Lord Jesus Christ hated. And you know what? There are some doctrines that we ought not to bear with. There are some deeds and doctrines. When someone come preaching another Jesus, when someone come tampering with the fundamentals of the faith, 
Listen, there are some doctrines that we ought not to receive. If heresy is heresy, you know what? We need to just stay away from it. We need to cast that wicked man out of the church. We need not to have fellowship with such a one as that. You don't have to turn to these verses. These are the last few verses here. But 2 John chapter 9, verse 11. Let's see what the Bible says. If it speaks about just bearing with someone who just come with just bad doctrine. And I'm not just talking about someone who may just be screwed up on a, you know, a, a, a scripture and revelation pre-trib. No, we're, not. we're talking about just fundamentals of the faith. And someone, well, hell isn't really hell. No, no, no. 2 John chapter 9, verse 11 says, Whosoever transgresseth and abideth not in the doctrine of Christ hath not God. He that abideth in the doctrine of Christ, he hath both the Father and the Son. If there come any unto you and bring not this doctrine, receive him not into your house. Well, that sounds like the Lord Jesus Christ is saying, don't bear with him. Don't put up with him. Receive him not into your house. So wait a minute. Does that mean that I can't? you know, pull out a, a red carpet for my Jehovah's Witness friend and my Mormon friend and just invite them in and just let them teach me a lesson? No, receive him not into your house. Neither bid him Godspeed. What is he talking about? Hey, you know what? Hey, I hope you guys go out and just tear this neighborhood up. I hope you turn it upside down with the gospel of Jesus Christ. No, they're preaching another gospel. Don't wish them Godspeed. Don't ask for a blessing to be upon them. For he that biddeth him Godspeed is partaker of his evil deeds. Romans chapter 16, verse 17 through 18. Now I beseech you, brethren, mark them which cause divisions and offenses contrary to the doctrine which ye have learned, and avoid them. Well, this sounds like the church of Ephesus, right? With the deeds of the Nicolaitans, with the doctrine of the Nicolaitans. Hey, avoid them. They're not letting them into the church. They were preaching contrary to the doctrine of Christ. Mark them which cause divisions and offenses contrary to the doctrine which ye have learned, and avoid them. Well, it sounds like he's saying, don't bear with them. Avoid them. Don't, well, let me just kind of go over there to his church and see what he has to say this week. Or, uh, let's just give him a platform and, and see what he has to say. He said, avoid them. For they that are such serve not our Lord Jesus Christ, but their own belly, and by good words and fair speeches deceive the hearts of the simple. You know, this church of Ephesus, yes, they got away from the first works, and that's a, a sermon by itself. But I like the, the fact that the Lord Jesus Christ was commending them on these three things of not just bearing with evildoers, just just malice and just all the type of wickedness and just vile acts that could creep in in the church. They were not bearing with it. Then the false apostles, those who, hey, yeah, we was with the Lord Jesus Christ the whole time. Don't bear with them. Then the deeds of the Nicolaitans. I mean, this church, although, yes, they got away from some things, it's, it's a good lesson to learn from them how, you know what, to stay vigilant. You know what, to, to try those who come in. Not saying that, oh, I don't know about that guy. We need to really... Well, you know what? Test them. Try them. You know what? You probably can set them straight, right? But then just in general, or just being aware as a church and being vigilant and not letting all type of evilness and wickedness creep into the church, you know, because, you know, a low leaven leaveneth the whole lump. So we don't want those type of things to spread. So let us be mindful of that. So looking at the church of Ephesus tonight is a good example. And with that, we can close on a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word this evening. Uh, we pray, Lord, that we would be vigilant, Lord, that we would be sober, that we know, Lord, that that enemy is looking to um, plant all type of wickedness into the churches, Lord. And I pray, Lord, that we just be vigilant not to allow those things in the churches, Lord, but that we be a new lump, Lord, that we be holy unto you, Lord God. Bless us as we leave this, uh, this place this evening and give us your traveling grace and mercies and Keep us throughout the week. In your son Jesus' name we pray. Amen.